Hello aspirants, looking at current affairs for 19th March, the news items picked up from the Hindu newspaper are these 14, out of which the first 7 are from Sunday newspaper, that is 18th March newspaper. So we will be discussing all these news items. The first news item is, the head of Trump call probe on Harley Davidson changed gears. So this is regarding Harley Davidson, which is a company from USA, which manufactures motorbikes and this Motorcycles which are imported, Harley Davidson motorcycles which are imported into the country, this has, this, these are having high import duties being paid is what President Donald Trump has been insisting on for long. It is, he says that there is 100% import duty which these bikes have to pay into the country. And India also imports, exports bikes to USA. So in USA also when bikes from India are imported, as such, they do not have to pay such high import duties. So that is a case being made though in terms of volume and in terms of value if you see that Indian imports are quite low and Indian imports are quite high of Harley Davidson and India's exports to US are quite low. So this issue, trade related issue Donald Trump has raised quite often. So he has spoken about it directly to Prime Minister Narendra Modi on various occasions too. And now we have seen that Directorate of Revenue Intelligence. It had initiated a slow motor investigation against Harley Davidson for evasion of import duty. So this case has now been closed. So it has closed this investigation. So it, it was alleged that import duty which it had to pay did not pay, it paid a lesser import duty. But now investigation has been closed and it is said just days before Prime Minister Narendra Modi spoke to US President Donald Trump, this case has been closed. So this is an issue being looked into. So actually, if you look at it, 100% import duty is paid on Harley Davidson bikes, but bikes which are imported as completely built units. But in recent times, we are seeing that the bikes from Harley Davidson are not completely built units imported. Volume is quite low. It is actually, Harley Davidson has set up its factory here. So pre-assembled bikes are also brought in. So you know, pre-assembled engines, etc are being brought in and the bikes are sold. So in those cases, the import duty is low. It is of 30% which has now been reduced to 25% in present budget. So union budget 2018 presently announced import duty for them coming down to 25%. So asking for 0% import duty, which President Donald Trump insists on, is said to be unjustified. So here you can see the details are given regarding investigation being closed as such. So here you can see when, how often President Donald Trump has raised this issue. He raised it in Feb 2017. In June 2017, again, he raised this issue with Prime Minister Narendra Modi. In August 2017, again, he spoke of the same issue, of trade-related issue. Again, November 2017, in Manila, when they met, again, he raised this issue with Prime Minister Narendra Modi. And in Feb also, he told the Congress, US Congress, President Trump said that India's duty cuts on Harley Davidson are not enough. So, this is the whole case. So, here you can see the reason for double price. So if import duty is 100% means whatever is the cost of Harley Davidson, it doubles up. You have to pay the equivalent amount as duty. So, this completely built units of bikes are having 100% import duty. 60% is import duty, 30% is actually the local taxes. So it almost doubles up. Then next is Pakistan withholds envoys return. So we know about the diplomatic stiff between India and Pakistan. So I mean, Pakistan had called its high commission from India and now it has said that it will not send its high commissioner back to Delhi till the diplomatic row is resolved. So the whole issue started with earlier the claims being made that Indian officials in Indian diplomats in Pakistan embassy were being harassed and then it was India which was alleged to be harassing Pakistani diplomats. So on both sides there are allegations, counter allegations. So this issue as again India has put a formal protest again, a second formal protest that Indian diplomats are subjected to aggressive surveillance and harassment in Pakistan and we have already discussed this that Pakistan actually is a non-family posting. So after the Peshawar attack in Pakistan, we have stopped 
diplomats uh, from India been posted in Pakistan to have their families up there too. While in India, Pakistani diplomats in New Delhi come with their families. So workers have been stopped from going to you know, for repairs, etc. In the, in the premises of diplomats. So all these issues had been raised on both sides actually. So this is also against the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. So this needs to be resolved has been highlighted. Then next is Orisha's dying largest freshwater lake to get a new lease of life. So this is regarding Orisha's largest freshwater lake, Ansuka. So this freshwater lake is actually an oxbow lake. So it is formed out of the meandering Mahanadi river. So Mahanadi river when it takes curves and moves that is called meandering river. So when siltation takes place, when silt is deposited on the banks of the river then a lake offshoot also comes up and that is an offshoot lake, Oxbow lake which Ansupa is, is the largest freshwater lake of Odisha. So it has resulted in so much of silting now from Mahanadi that water inflow from Mahanadi to it has stopped. So that is why now state government is taking initiative to give it a new lease of life. So dredging would be done. So dredging means that this silt can be removed so that again it can get water supply from the Mahanadi river. It is said that there is almost no water supply to the lake since 2014. So it is choking to death. So now under the national plan for conservation of aquatic ecosystems, funding has been provided for this Ansupa uh, freshwater lake being revived. So you can see the last mouth is repeatedly silted up by sand deposited by the meandering river Mahanadi. So this is the news. It's also the breeding ground, wintering ground for 32 species of migratory birds. So it's a wetland of national importance to Ansupa Lake, a freshwater lake from Orisha, which is in use. Then next is new species of water strider found in Nagaland River. So scientists from Zoological Survey of India have discovered a new species of water strider. So water strider is a type of insect that is adapted to life on the surface of water. So it strides means it moves on the surface of the water using surface tension to its advantage. So it can jump on water or you can say walk on water. So this water striders, there are various species. A new species has been discovered in India from Nagaland. It was found in river in Tanki. So river in Tanki in Nagaland. So the species has been found, which has been named as Tilomera, Nagalanda, Jihamalar, and Chandra. So this is a water strider species. So far, five species of water striders under this Tiloma, Tilomera subgenus have been known in India, and now this one has been found. Also, water striders are said to be a good indicator of water quality as such. They play an important role in the food chain too because they feed on the mosquito larvae. So that is also a positive contribution by these water striders. So this is the new species. You can see its size is quite small. This is 2 millimeter scale. Then next is a floating laboratory to save the famed Loktak Lake. So this is regarding Loktak Lake in Manipur in the northeast. So so uh, actually uh, floating laboratories means a boat as a laboratory has been moving around on the Loktak Lake. It is the largest freshwater lake in northeast India. It has become a dump yard for municipal waste too. So though the situation is not worrying presently, but then it is the early signs and steps need to be taken up and highlighted. So this custom built motor board is taking water for analysis from the lake some some are done in the lab on the motorboat and some are all even taken to the fledged lab for testing. So recording is done of temperature, acidity, conductivity and even dissolved oxygen in the water in this lake. So this is Loktak Lake. It is also having fumaris. So these fumaris are unique floating islands. So floating islands means actually it is a mix of vegetable and soil. So these have coalies and formed a thick mat for centuries and they have hosted huts and fishing settlements as such. So there are these unique floating islands on this the lake as such too. So the, if the lake is affected then these fumaries would also be affected. And you should know Loktak lake has in its within it even the Kibul Lamjao National Park. 
so that is also located in this missing key you can see so it's said to be the only floating national park in the world kihul lamjao national park in manipur it's on the loktak lake it's the largest national it's the last natural habitat of sangai deer which is also known as dancing deer so this dancing deer from manipur sangai deer because it is walking on this uh, you know uh, mud and vegetable on vegetation which is on the lake so it moves quite swiftly so it looks like a dance so this is the sangai deer from here so all these information is important because even environment biodiversity mcqs are also as in prelims then next is violent protests not basic rights says supreme court so this was actually on a petition which had been filed by gorkha janmukti morcha leader bimal guru so gjm was in uh, protesting in west bengal in the darjeeling hills demanding a separate state gorkha land so these pr uh, protests which were going on in this he uh, arrest warrant had been issued against him by the west bengal government and he was demanding protection against arrest from the supreme court so petition was filed but the supreme court has said that public demonstrations resorting to violence including stone throwing are not protected by fundamental right of speech and expression article fundamental right under article 19 of the constitution so this has been clarified that you have a right to protest but not violent protests so this is there it says that it uh, this fundamental right does not give agitators a license to resort to violence destroying property at times and even lives of citizens so this has been rejected the constitution protects right to assemble peacefully without arms that is clearly stated on the article 19 so you should know article 19 of the constitution even right to free speech is to be restricted it includes right to speak in public but it should not incite violence even kerala high court almost 20 years ago had given its judgment so this judgment is also reiterated by the supreme court in this present case this was a judgment on bugs that no political party or organization can claim that it is entitled to paralyze the industry and commerce in the entire state or nation using violent means so this is not a right as such so here you can see article 19 of the constitution is mentioned so protection of certain rights so all citizens have right to there are these rights out of which f was regarding right to property which has been omitted so right to freedom of speech and expression is there right to assemble peacefully without arms okay so of course there are conditions also restrictions on this reasonable restrictions on each of these rights then next is india warms to cold fusion so this is regarding cold fusion which is also known as low energy nuclear reaction so this cold fusion or you know, this successor technology as such this is called a false hope by many scientists across the world but there is research going on in various countries and india is also having research restored in the country after 25 years after prc baba atomic research center following global criticism against this idea shut down this research so research on cold fusion has been taking place at least by three research groups in the country from iit kanpur iit bombay included so this cold fusion basically means at low energy nuclear reaction taking place or nuclear energy produced by without harmful radiation or complex equipments by using very high temperatures and pressure as such so no high temperature pressure is used and you are having cold fusion nuclear energy generated so this actually is being debated it is said to be against the well established physics laws that easy fusion of nuclei cannot take place so when two nuclei fuse together and a lot of energy is generated but it does not take place so easily so this is the whole thing but india has also initiated research now in countries like us japan china russia italy france as well as ukraine are having research on this so even in india m shrinivasan who was a veteran of the pokhran one test the nuclear test which we conducted he was former leader of drc's neutron physics division he had in 1990 helped validate the original fleischmann pons cold fusion experiment 
So this Fleischmann Kahn's cold fusion experiment was also the genesis of this idea of cold fusion. So we'll see what was it too. Here you can see. So interaction of hydrogen or deuterium gas with metals such as palladium, zirconium and nickel is claimed to set off a nuclear reaction at low temperature. So generally we understand nuclear reaction taking place at very high temperatures. Nuclear fission which takes place in nuclear reactors also requires very high temperature and pressure. And also nuclear fusion which takes place on the surface of the sun is at very high temperatures. But cold fusion means nuclear fusion at lower temperatures. So this it said this such reactions are set to uh, set off nuclear fusion at low temperatures releasing energy. So it was first claimed in 1989 by Fleischmann and Pons of University of Utah in US. So here the issue this idea gained attention but then it was criticized because there is lack of scientific uh, you know, evidence in this case as such too. But researchers across the world are working including in India. So here the, you can see, so they had worked together and they had worked for 5 years to develop a process which seemed to yield too much energy to be a simple chemical reaction. So excess heat generated, they had announced this finding at a press conference. So it was criticized that normally it should be announced in a research paper that would be peer reviewed, reviewed by other fellow scientists. But that it was not published in a scientific journal, it was announced at a press conference. So it faced severe criticism because of that too. And cold fusion, which can more correctly be called low energy nuclear reaction, this is still being you know, worked on, so experimented upon. So here you can see how it was done. So platinum, palladium being used and you can see the amount of heat generated in this fusion reaction. So deuterium and oxygen gases as such are here. So the heat generated is quite high. So this. Uh, this is giving an indication towards cold fusion reaction is what was the case. Then next is two more indigo jets grounded. So we have seen that indigo and goair, the two prominent aircraft carriers, domestic aircraft carriers in the country have had their Airbus aircraft grounded recently and the reason being that there was problem with their engines. So, these old series of Pratt and Whitney engines in, have seen incidents occurring because of which these aircrafts have been grounded by the Directorate. So, the Directorate of Civil Aviation has taken action against them. So, you can see the Director General of Civil Aviation has grounded around 11 A320 NEO planes too and which have been, uh, you know, uh, which have these PNW engines, Pratt and Whitney engines of a particular series. So, this is actually affecting passengers also. Many flights have also been cancelled and passengers have been affected. But then uh, they have to be safe, safe cars have to be there in place. So, this is an essential step taken. You can see the problems which occurred in the last two flights which have been grounded too. So, in one, metal chips were detected in the jet's engine oil. So, it was grounded. And other, another one also was grounded because of hydraulic leak from its engine. So here you can see the details provided as such too. So these are A320 aircrafts, uh, the most popular single aisle twin engine aircrafts used for domestic flights in the country. So they are powered by Pratt and Whitney engines and they have been seen, seen failure since their introduction in 2016. So you can see here. So worldwide, you can see uh, PNW engines are delivered to Airbus worldwide to 18 operators. So there are 113 worldwide and 45 in India belonging to two Indian carriers, Indigo and Goa, which are budget aircrafts. So they have been grounded in Europe also, these uh, Airbuses with these engines. And India has also initiated action against them, seeing various failures as such. The next is Lok Sabha passes bill to exempt political parties from scrutiny on foreign funds without debate. So this is regarding the finance bill 2018 being passed. So first of all you should know that the budget being passed actually means the appropriation bill and finance bill being passed. So here you can see the Lok Sabha has adopted the budget 2018-19 by passing the appropriation bill 
and the finance bill so these are the two bills appropriation bill is a bill which authorizes the government departments to spend money from consolidated fund of india so money is appropriated for various purposes so that has to be passed the bill has to be passed by parliament then only it is authorized to use the money from the consolidated fund and finance bill is containing taxation proposals so various tax related matters like how money will come in that is in finance bill and how money will be you know spent that is in appropriation bill so both together form the budget so budget 2018-19 has been passed because both these bills have been passed but they have been approved without debate though there are three weeks remaining for the current budget session of the parliament to end to we have seen the first two sessions of the budget budget session of the parliament presently being a complete washout because of protests by various political parties for various reasons opposition parties have been protesting but the budget being passed without debate has taken place even though three weeks remain for the session to be concluded so this is being highlighted it's only the third time since 2000 that parliament has approved the budget without debate so this is the case you can see here and in this present finance bill which has been passed the finance bill 2018 there is also provision to amend fcra that is Foreign Contribution Regulation Act of 2010. So this act has earlier also been amended. It was in 2016 Finance Bill 2 that amendments were proposed to it. And now again for the amendments have taken place. So the whole issue you should know. See you can see Finance Bill 2016 also had amended this. So the issue is that political parties are not allowed to accept foreign funds. It is not allowed even under representation of people set and FCRA also has provisions regarding it. So political parties cannot accept foreign funds. Right. So this finance bill 2016, two years ago, passed by the PJP government, it had amended FCRA Act of 2010 so that the definition of foreign companies as such will change. So what it did was that a company Indian or foreign which is registered abroad so this was the case that if it is registered abroad is a foreign form so they changed this because FCR, FCRA act called for this so FCRA act was changed that's actually the earlier FCRA act of 1976 which was replaced by FCRA act of 2010 and further amended in 2016 too so in 2016 act changed the definition of a foreign company by saying that a firm with less than 50 percent of share capital held by a foreign entity would not be a foreign source it's not a foreign company because for less than 50 percent share is not by held by foreign entity so less than 50 percent by foreign means majority is with indians so it's not a foreign company Though it may be registered abroad or it may have its subsidiary abroad, still it would not be a foreign company. So FCRA Act of 1976 actually defined so that any company Indian or foreign registered abroad or with subsidiaries abroad is a foreign company. But it was repealed. 1976 Act was repealed, replaced by the Act of 2010. And this 2010 Act was also further simplified, making foreign company definition still simpler. And that is why the political parties were exempt from taking foreign fund from such companies which have less than 50 percent share capital with foreign entities so actually there was a case against both bjp and congress and the delhi high court had given its ruling in which it had held guilty both the political parties regarding violation of fcr so for this reason what they did was after this 2014 judgment in 2016 they changed the definition so BJP changed the definition which held both political parties and now in the Finance Act of 2018, the present Finance Act, the changes which have been made are that because the 19th century, so what happened is with Finance Act of 2009, 2016, what changes took place, this took place with effect from 2010 because this was the new Act of 2010 which has been amended. So this was also came into effect retrospectively from September 2010. But then the political parties had taken foreign funds earlier too. So they were uh, they were guilty of violations even before 19, before 2010, means since 1976. So now the finance bill of 2018 is replacing this, amend, amending FCRA Act, replacing this 2010 to 2016, sorry, to 1976. 
So from 1976 onward, it would have a retrospective effect. Though the 1976 Act is already written. So this is the present change which is being done. So here you can see the entire detail of what we discuss is also given in a gist. Then next is army to buy air defense system. So after several trials and delays, now the Indian army is going to buy these very short range air defense system, which also called the short AD. So these very short air defense systems would have a, a maximum range of 6 kilometers and an altitude of 3 kilometer as such. And they would have all weather capabilities. So this is the requirement. These very short range air defense systems are required by India to replace the IGLA, which are the Russian or Soviet man portable surface to air missiles, which we have presently. So a request for proposal for these very short range air defense system was first issued in October 2010 and there have been trials and retrials taking place because retrials were required because it would result into one vendor situation and single vendor situation results in cancellation of the tender under the defense procurement procedure. So that is why retrials were allowed and finally three companies are in contest for this very short range air defense systems which the army would buy as such from them. So we have a requirement of around 5000 missiles and even 58 single launchers and multi launchers as such. So it's a 6500 crore tender. So three companies are presently contesting for this. They are MBDF from France, Rosoboron Export of Russia and Saab of Sweden. So now finally this tender would also be issued to the one of the companies and then cost negotiations would begin. So here you can see these are the various air defense systems which the Indian Army has. So you can see very short range presently we have the Gila which will be replacing now by this through this tender. Then next is Turkey led forces seize control of Afrin. So this is regarding the Afrin region here in Syria where Turkey has gained control supporting the Syrian rebels. So Syrian rebels who are against the Bashar al-Assad government are supported by Turkey and they are fighting against the Kurdish militia. So it's not the Syrian government which has control over this region, it is the Kurdish militia forces. And Kurdish are considered as terrorists by Turkey because Kurds, Kurds demand a separate state of Kurdistan and they have these separatist elements in Turkey. So Turkey is a neighbor of Syria. So this northern region of Syria also is affected by Kurdish, Kurdish militia and that's why Turkey's president Recep Tayyip Erdogan has taken a stone step and he has brought in his military might. You know, Turkish troops and supporting the Syrian rebels, they have made the Kurdish, Kurdish militia flee this city, Afrin city of Syria, and they have control over it now. So in Syria, we are seeing that in two regions, heavy fighting is taking place. One is in the eastern Ghouta region near Damascus, which is the Syrian government, Bashar al-Assad government, with support from Russia is fighting against the Syrian rebels. And here in Afrin, where Turkish government along with support from Syrian rebels is fighting against Kurdish militia. So presently it has been able to capture this city, Turkey. And also Turkish president said that the operation could move to other Kurdish controlled areas of northern Syria also. So this was also a statement coming forth. So here you can see the Syrian state as a the country and this is Turkey, a neighbor. So the northern Syrian region here, Afrin is the city located here. So this purple region denotes regions under Syrian rebel forces now. And Islamic State has control on some regions. This is as of Jan 2018. And Syrian government has control over other regions in green. Then next is DP World. NIIF joint venture picks Continental for first investment. So DP World has got a joint venture with NIIF. NIIF we have discussed quite often. We'll discuss it once again presently too. National Investment and Infrastructure Fund, the fund set up by the government. So a joint venture between DP World, which is from Dubai. So this uh, joint venture has been named Hindustan Infralog Private Limited. So this has announced its first acquisition now, first investment of HIPL has been announced, which is acquisition of 90% stake 
stake in Continental Warehousing Corporation of Navasheva. So this is an integrated multimodal logistics player in the country and this 90% stake has been taken in. So other private equity majors have exited the investment and 90% stake is by this joint venture now. The founders, the Reddy family have remaining 10% stake. So this is regarding this investment. You should basically know about NIIF. So NIIF is a fund created by government of India for enhancing infrastructure finance in the country. So it is, it is set up as a trust to raise debt to invest in the equity of infrastructure finance companies. So these infrastructure finance companies can then leverage the extra equity manifold and invest in infrastructure projects. So this was announced, NIF was announced in budget 2015-16. It has been registered with SEBI as an alternative investment fund in December 2015 as such. So this is the idea. So what is expected is a multiplier effect, that an investment being done which will further invest resulting in multiplier effect. So even NIF has 20,000 crore from government and another 20,000 crore from investors including sovereign wealth funds. So government stake is said to be kept below 50% to give the fund a private sector character. So it's a fund of funds which will fund various you know, infrastructure funding companies, finance companies and they will further invest in infrastructure projects. So this is the whole thing and you can see the further details also of the governance structure and the source of funds is given here for NIIF. And this is regarding the present case of continental warehousing where 90% stake has been taken by this joint venture of NIF and DP World. Then next is no power of choice for consumers. So this is an article which is talking about how power uh, power is becoming cheaper because various auctions are taking place for wind and solar power generation. So solar companies, wind companies are bidding quite low. So they are bidding quite low to sell power to various power discounts, power distribution companies which are state utility firms. So here you can see the auctions, the quote prices as low as 2.44 a unit of electricity as such. Even means there are many are under 3, under rupees 3. But when we buy power from the state utility firms, so these powers are brought by consumers at rupees 6 per unit. And even factories, commercial power is at higher price of even double the price of rupees 12 per unit. So why do we have to pay so high prices when power utility firms get them for such low rates? So this is a question being raised. Actually, Electricity Act of 2003 also has a provision for having an open market for electricity. It means if anyone could produce power anywhere, it can sell it to anyone else at a mutually agreed price. So when a large power purchaser is there, like a large factory or something, then they can have use the open market. So there's a free and open market for power as such in the legislation. But in practice, it does not prevail. It's still elusive. The way for telecom sector, it is said that we can go from one telecom company to another who is giving us better prices and better deals. This is not the case with power companies because it is the state government's monopoly. So electricity distribution companies are owned by state governments. So they are still a monopoly. And they do not... The consumers do not have an option and this is said customers pay for the inefficiencies of these distribution companies and also not just this but some customers pay high some are subsidized. So when subsidies are also provided say to farmers for power etc there is a cross subsidy charge. A crop subsidy subcharge surcharge means consumers have to pay higher price for the subsidies which others are getting. So this is also an issue being raised. Even national tariff policy of 2016 said that direct subsidy is better way to support poorer category of consumers than cross subsidizing. But this still takes place in the power sector which is highlighted. Also for large consumers of power, they can directly purchase power from suppliers but state discounts do not allow them to do this because they use various provisions under which it is restricted to sell power from, you know, to have the power sold to companies outside. So they don't allow power to go out from the state also. So power producers in that state 
are not allowed to supply outside the borders. So this provision of the Electricity Act is used by state governments to their advantage. Even Central Electricity Regulatory Commission has also given certain various orders in which it has denied open access. So this situation is highlighted in this article. So there is differences in tariffs across states, but then this open access policy is not put into effect which is there in the Electricity Act of 2003. That those with connected load of 1 megawatt and above can buy cheaper power from the open market. But it is not put into effect because of the state monopoly and the law and provisions in their favor, which they use to their advantage. And the last news item is a measure of manufacturing. So this is regarding PMI, Purchasing Man Manufacturer index and purchasing managers index and iip index of industrial production so both these indices give an indication of industrial production of the manufacturing sector but then pmi we know is a private sector survey and iip is a government survey another difference between the two is that iip measures output while pmi measures input so, IIP index of industrial production. So, how much is the production output is seen, but PMI purchasing managers index measures activity at the purchasing or input stage. So, there is a lacuna in both the indices because they do not measure informal sector activity. And of course, both are based on surveys, then it is only a sample of the entire formal manufacturing sector which has been surveyed. How PMI is conducted is also detailed out here. So, in Key India Manufacturing PMI, it is based on data compiled from monthly survey responses from purchasing managers from around 400 manufacturing companies. So, it's a composite index which is giving weightage to various aspects like new order, output, employment, suppliers, delivery times, and stock of items purchased. And based on this, the index is prepared and as we have already discussed quite often a value above 50 in PMI indicates expansion in the sector and below 50 indicates contraction. So this has been the performance of manufacturing and services PMI in the country over the last few months till Jan 2018. So these are the news items. Thank you.